Thank you, Kathleen. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, talk about wild blueberries. I do this quite a bit. Sometimes I just feel like I'm a tour guide in the summertime, you know, bringing people around the blueberry fields <laughs> and doing the, doing the uh, lecture circuit, but uh, it's all part of the job. Uh, as uh, Kathleen said, the Cooperative Extension is really the educational outreach uh, arm of the University of Maine. My function is to, uh, is to educate the public uh, and, and wild blueberry growers as to uh, what's going on, best management practices, and uh, also inform the public uh, of what's going on. We have uh, tours that we give to uh, legislative groups and, uh, and children along the way. So this is actually, this poster here is an uh, icon. It's got the, the black bear and blue rice. And this is, uh, this is one of our summer, uh, summer uh, school or some university uh, uh, posters to encourage students to come to the University of Maine. Mm. So, uh, but, you know, uh, when I talk about blueberries, I say, well, you know, I like to start at the beginning, and actually the beginning was uh, about 10,000 years ago. Uh, there was a, a glacier here, two miles of ice, right where we are now. So this land was really depressed down into the ocean. Uh, all of, all of the uh, water was locked up into the glacier, and as that uh, glacier receded and melted and actually ground up all the, well, first it pushed all the soil out uh, uh, off, the, off the land and into the uh, uh, St. George's uh, Bay here. So that's where all the food uh, for the cod came from, all, that, all those nutrients from the soil off the land. And uh, as it receded, it ground up a lot of the sand uh, into uh, marine clay and about 100 feet of sand. So, what you have really is, uh, when that receded, is a very sterile environment. Uh, nothing really can grow without any nutrients. And uh, so how did the blueberries get here? Well, we had uh, bears and birds that ate the seed and migrating north. And they had their own little starter packages of fertilizer that they provided. <laughs> but uh, that, that, uh, that is how they get uh, established. They're, they're really what they call early successionary species, so they're a plant that can colonize the landscape, uh, very stressful conditions, low nutrients, uh, high drought. Really, there weren't any nutrients at all after that fertilizer package uh, uh, ran out, so how did they survive in that type of environment? Well, they got infected. And you say, well, I can't be good at uh, getting infected, but what they got infected was uh, with a mycorrhizal fungi. So fungi infected the roots of the plants and actually cause the roots uh, to be extended. The fungi uh, function as really small hair roots, but the fungi are able to break down nutrients from, the, from bound nutrients in the soil. So things that are bound tightly, but the plant can't, can't get, the plant has to have uh, nutrients in the soil solution. They were able to extract that. And so what they did is give that to the plant, and the plant in turn uh, traded nutrients, sugars, for it to grow. So this is what we call a symbiotic relationship, this uh, mycorrhizal association. And this really uh, allowed the, the wild blueberries to establish early in the landscape where other plants couldn't. And once they established over time, the forest grew up, and that's how uh, the blueberries uh, came to Maine. We have two types of blueberries. Uh, one is called a low sweet blueberry, and probably 95% of the plants in the field are the low sweet. And the other is the sour top or velvet leaf blueberry. And actually, these blueberries look somewhat the same, but they're highly incompatible genetically. Mm -hmm. One has a diploid, one's a tetraploid. So when they cross, you don't actually even get viable fruit. Actually, the high bush in Maine, those found along the lakes, are also tetraploid. So they can cross readily and, and have uh, hybrids. You can have intermediate hybrids uh, from the high bush. So those two are related, but we still do have those two uh, species in the field. And if there's about a 50-50 mix, they, they really cause a problem. As, as we see up in western Maine, uh, they don't, uh, aren't very productive. So where do wild blueberries grow? Wild blueberries, uh, unlike most blueberries, uh, most of the cultivated blueberries, are really concentrated in Maine, uh, Atlantic Canada, and Quebec. So it's very regionalized. It's, these two species are very regionalized. They haven't found any other areas of the world. And really, it's the only uh, crop that is uh, a wild crop that is commercially managed, that very successfully commercial, commercially managed. Uh, most other crops are, are not. 
The other type of high bush, uh, the ones that most people what we like to call regular blueberries, uh, are, are, are very large, uh, large fruited. Uh, they're on bushes, uh, larger berries, bushes are about six foot high. They're principally picked for a fresh market uh, off the plant, and then they have an over the road type harvester that goes in uh, at the end of the season. But, uh, so this is the type of blueberry you find in most stores uh, and throughout the world. And actually, they are a North American species. This high bush blueberry is North American. Uh, they've been bred here, but they're easily propagated with a hardwood cutting. Uh, you can take hardwood cutting, stick it in the soil at roots three to five years, you get this huge plant just full of blueberries. Uh, well, wild blueberry doesn't like to propagate well. Uh, you can take a, a hardwood cuttings will propagate, softwood cuttings have to be propagated under a mist system. And then when you got the blueberry, a uh, few blueberries to root, they think they're an adult plant. So they try to grow up like a high bush, but that's no good because our blueberries need to grow out to fill in on the fields. So consequently, we don't really see any uh, uh, plantings of, uh, cultiv of, of uh, cultivated low bush blueberries, except in one place, China. They've got one of the bloomidin species is easily roots in, in, a, uh, in a peat moss. They've got plenty of peat moss. They get plenty of propagation. So they've got field maybe of 40 hectares of, of uh, a cultivated low bush blueberry, which is very unusual. There's a few in Canada. But uh, pretty much all of our wild blueberries are from uh, stands that have established it as far back as the glacier. And when we do look at the, the three types of blueberries, uh, this is a cultivated blueberry. And this is a wild blueberry. And this is a European bilberry. So this is what the, what the Europeans were expecting when they came, to, uh, came over to North America. They found a much bigger and better blueberry, and they've taken a lot of these blueberries back. And the reason this blueberry is so big is that actually it's been selected uh, from the wild for it to be a larger fruit. Uh, back in Chatsworth, New Jersey, Elizabeth White gave a bounty for the largest berry. And that became really the basis of the cultivated blueberry industry, and they've subsequently uh, uh, bred the berries to be even even larger down there. Down in Georgia, they've got blueberries the size of uh, size of grapes, uh, much much larger. Which is so. If you look at and this is a, what they call a distribution curve, a normal distribution curve, uh, and and it kind of uh, explains the productivity of wild blueberries versus cultivated blueberries. And we see it can go uh, from here, we, when, we, when we did a, a study of 100 different blueberry clones or different blueberry plants, we found it went from about 300 pounds to about 18,000 pounds an acre uh, on average and, uh, on, on each of the clones. So there's a, a vast difference in productivity, versus the cultivated blueberries have all been picked from the high end. So there's a very, very much more narrow uh, range of, of, of uh, species in there. And, and in, in the cultivated fields too, they usually have early, late, and mid varieties, uh, early, mid, and late season, season varieties to extend the season over. We have all of those happening all at once in our fields. Uh, and usually they only have a half dozen or so different plants in our fields. But wild blueberry plants, literally they have hundreds and thousands of different uh, plants in the fields because each one of those plants was established originally from a seedling, uh, from a seed. Everybody's been on Google Earth, I think, and if you do uh, look in Google Earth, uh, if you look down east on the Blueberry Barrens, uh, this is Margill Lake in here, you can see all of these fields that are established in through the woods. It's actually Cranberry Bog here. This is an over horizon radar site. Uh, that radar site was built to uh, detect Russian bombers um, coming over, and the, the transmitter was in Moscow, Maine. I don't know who, who figured that out. <laughs> <laughs> Put it in Moscow. And uh, that's been mothballed now since the Russian bears aren't on a problem anymore, we figure. Uh, so they, and they have plenty of satellites uh, that's no longer used. But we have about 44,000 acres and actually two of the largest fruit farms in the U.S. You'd think it would be in California, but uh, some of the fruit farms up 10,000 acres, 8 or 10,000 acres of productivity in, uh, uh, in Maine. The other uh, big difference between wild blueberries and the cultivated blueberries is that we prune our plants every other year. So what we have is a, a, a prune field uh, followed by a crop field, and we have a two-year cycle, so we will go back and forth. And this is because we need to prune the plants to uh, rejuvenate the plants and increase the productivity. If you prune the plants to the ground, they'll come up and they'll be much more productive. 
yet we'll only have vegetative growth this year and fruiting this year. So twice as, it takes twice as many acres to grow our blueberry plants, but what this does effectively is disrupt insect and disease cycles. So we have a, we have a, a built-in pest management program just with our management, just that two-year pruning cycle allows us to uh, allows us to greatly reduce the, the, the amount of uh, any pest, pesticide inputs that we might need for our fields. Originally, uh, the Native Americans certainly uh, burned over these fields over the years, and, and we see evidence of that on the Blueberry Barrens, these bogs with uh, layers of uh, layers of blackened uh, tissue over the time. Uh, these uh, how the Blueberry Barrens were kept open, and uh, you can see here. Uh, back in the 50s, uh, they adapted this oil burner. Uh, the oil burners were used originally on railroad right-of-ways before they had chemicals to burn back the brush uh, so that, you know, the sparks wouldn't create a fire uh, with, the, with, the, uh, with the trains. And so this, uh, this made sense back when uh, oil was $3 a gallon, go out and burn the fields, especially when they're rocky and un uneven. But when, you know, when uh, the price of oil got up to around $5 and and, and certainly uh, issues with global warming and, and use, of, use of these, uh, these uh, oil for this practice has really largely been discontinued. There's only a few smaller fields that still use uh, fire for burning. Uh, most of the fields are, are, are mowed now. And the reason we really did this is because look at the nature of the field. That glacier came in, it, it didn't grind up all rocks. A lot of the, a lot of the fields have uh, uh, boulders in them. Really the only way to, you really can't mow around these, uh, the only way to, to pr uh, prune those fields is through burning. So a lot of these fields are no longer in production at all. Or if there's uh, not that many rocks, they use excavators. They'll pull the rocks out and they'll track back and forth. So this makes the field level enough to be pruned mechanically and also be harvested mechanically. And these are the two highest inputs. These are the two highest costs of, of production of blueberries. And since we're competing with blueberries throughout the world now, we have to be, remain competitive uh, to stay in the marketplace. Even though we have a much better product, uh, those cheaper blueberries are a real challenge uh, to, to market against. So here's some rocks. If you want some rocks, plenty of rocks down east. You know, you can take them, take them back. We always offer them to the tourists, for sure. <laughs> you know, hopefully they'll take them. But they're kind of, they either put them on the side of the uh, fields or, or pile them up around. Uh, but they are quite a, quite a bit of a hazard. But getting those, uh, getting those rocks out makes this field competitive now because you can actually manage it at much lower cost than burning <laughs> and harvesting. So this is the type of machine we use uh, to prune the fields. And this is actually a flail type mower, and it's segmented, so they're three foot section. So it follows the contour of the land. We need to prune the plants within one inch of the soil. So if you can't get down that low, you have new growth coming off the stubble stems, and it's much, much less productive, and yields go down uh, considerably. So this is uh, specialized equipment, like a lot of things in wild blueberries, or small industry, small crop, would build their own equipment. So this has been custom built to uh, prune wild blueberry fields. <coughs> and we can do this because the blueberry plant architecture, like cultivated blueberry, we have these big stems sticking up with the, with the berries on them. Our stem is underneath the ground. It's called a rhizome. A rhizome is an underground stem. And so two-thirds of the biomass of the plant is under, underneath the soil. When we come in and prune, we get this new growth popping up from this, uh, this uh, storage structure, a rhizome. And so we can get uh, new growth, uh, juvenile growth, more productive growth in that first year. And uh, we form our fruit buds uh, on that for the, for the, for the growth, uh, for the crop coming on the second year. So first year is no production. Uh, we have a vegetative field and you can see right here, this is a little bit different color. This is a little bit different color. This, this plant is a little bit different color. Well, this, these are all one plant grown from seed. We've got plants on the blueberry barrens that are the size of a football field, one, one, one particular plant. So generally, over time, you know, they'll fill into a continuous map. We don't have rows uh, like most plants to drive your tractors down. We have to drive over our plants uh, so that we do a lot of our management, uh, our weed management practices in that first year so we're not driving over the berries and we're able to uh, keep, that, uh, keep that field uh, uh, in production. 
In the fall, we see nice red colors. A lot of people go down east to, to, look, to look at the leaves. If they get on, if you get down through the blueberry barns, you get quite a treat to, during, during uh, September, October. We get nice red, and you can see even the different colors, the difference in colors in these plants. And here's some little, actually the white ones are in there, sauerkraut plants, uh, the, the other, other species of blueberries. So we, we do uh, have uh, open land. Uh, the open land provides wildlife habitat. Uh, and Maine is uh, being over 90% forested. This is something that's uh, good to have, to have some open land in there. And we also have some nice critters. I saw some of these on the way down the fields uh, coming in. They reintroduced the, uh, the turkeys in the fields. And they're out in the blueberry fields too. They like it. Uh, they like it a lot out there. Some of the growers complain, well, you know, they're, you know, eat my blueberries, they got big feet and they're knocking the berries off. And, and we had a grad student uh, come down here and actually in the Union area, and she watched the turkeys from a blind and she counted how many pecks the turkeys would do and we figured out how big a turkey is. It did turkey energetics, how many, how many blueberries could a turkey eat? And we figured all that and, and basically what we found out is that, you know, the turkeys are also in the field without any blueberries. So they're eating insects, pests. And they don't eat that many blueberries. We, we couldn't even measure the amount of blueberries and, and if they complained, well, look, look, they're eating some bugs, you're just paying for services rendered. <laughs> we do have turkeys. Uh, some don't like it, but uh, a lot of people do like seeing those turkeys in the field as well. So over the winter, uh, we used to get a lot of snow. Uh, it's not as cold in the winter anymore, so it's not as important, but snow actually is a good blanket for blueberries. Uh, if you're sticking up and it's 20 below and the wind's blowing and you're desiccating the stems, they dry out. If you get a nice blanket of snow over you, that protects the plants. So, so having that snow cover uh, has a bit, been important in the past, not so much in the, in, in the present. And uh, early, early that, that, uh, the second year, you can see these buds that were formed in the first year, and then they become flowers uh, coming into May. And this is where the, uh, the plants start uh, coming alive again on that second year growth. We have lots of other critters that like blueberries. We're not the only ones that like blueberries uh, as well. There are lots of spanworms and flea beetles and drip curls. And so we really do have to be vigilant uh, in monitoring for these pests and, and ensure they, uh, we have enough left over for ourselves. Uh, so we have a, a very good IPM program. And this is, uh, this is one of the tools we use, one of these little butterfly nets. Uh, we go out and we do 10 sweeps and, and then we count the number of flea beetles or, or spam worm. And if they're uh, are below a threshold level, it costs you more to control them than it's worth. We don't treat it at all. But what we don't want to do is have something like this right here. Those plants came up and they were chewed right back to the ground. They would come up and chewed back, back to the ground. So this area will grow in. It'll be nice and green uh, the next year when you, when you have a harvest, but there won't be any fruit on it because the plants have been set back to an extent that they can't produce. So what we want to do is prevent this. We prevent this by, by monitoring and we only spray the areas where the pests are when the pests are there. We also have another disease that's called mummyberry disease, and, and it's called mummyberry because it has this little mummified fruit, and that mummified fruit is actually the propagule for a fungal disease. It falls through the soil surface and it generates this cup the next year, and it shoots spores out. And the spores cause a blighting on the blossoms and on the leaves. And you can see this field has a little brown spot, but the whole field isn't brown. That's because that genetic diversity in the field means some plants are more susceptible or in a susceptible stage. So the whole field doesn't get white brown. If you had one variety of blueberries, uh, then this, this field would be completely, uh, completely obliterated. But we also uh, have uh, some more science that allows us to manage this particular disease. And it's Canadian, the Canadians come up with this, uh, this chart where you look at the temperature, you look at the moisture, and then we actually put some of the, collect some of these mummy berries and put them out in the soil. And when that is in the high zone, that means we have to protect the plants. The soil, this fungal disease infects the plants and it causes a blight. And the only way we can prevent it is we put a sterile inhibitor type fungicide on, prevents it from infecting the plant. If you see the disease, you see the damage is too late. You can't, you can't reverse it. So we have to know when it's going to occur uh, so we can effectively uh, put, an, uh, put an application out. And we have uh, monitoring stations throughout the state. Uh, our uh, pathologist, Shauna Anas, has uh, looks at measuring the temperature and the moisture. 
And these are all uh, tied in by telephone modem uh, to the university's main computer, and it generates uh, risk assessments uh, for, uh, for the growers. Uh, they can go to the site themselves. She also has, uh, we also sent out a listserv. Anybody on the listserv gets a, it, says uh, if uh, in Waldeboro it's an infection period, they get, a, they get an email telling them that. Or if they don't have a computer, we also have a 1 800 number. She, she, uh, she puts the information on, on a telephone. You can call up the 1 800 number to get that. So we really do want to encourage our growers to be able to understand when this disease occurs and how to uh, protect it by putting a spray down. They used to put two or three sprays down, now we put maybe once every other two years to protect. And, and if we don't have, if we have a very dry spring, uh, then we don't have to treat, uh, treat it at all. We also had another, another pest which really co-evolved uh, with, a, with a wild blueberry, and it's called a blueberry fruit fly. But what happens is it lays an egg in the fruit and creates a maggot. And uh, back in the back when they're canning blueberries, and, and uh, uh, early on when they first started canning them, uh, the Chicago housewife would open up a can, have a nice layer of cream on the top. That's pretty good. That's maggots. Uh, so they they uh, they indicated they didn't like that. Uh, so we had a we had an entomologist come from Washington D.C. That's there from the government. They were going to help us, and they did. Really, they uh, they helped us understand the life cycle of of the of the fruit fly. Uh, when it comes out uh, and how to treat it, but unfortunately, you know, back then we had uh, things like calcium arsenate, uh, so very, very harsh chemicals to, to do that. We uh, no longer have that. We have some more specific uh, targeted materials uh, that we can use to, to control the fruit fly. We also have a way to determine when it gets there. Back in the 1970s, uh, our entomologist, Dr. Porthite, adapted this. Pepcon is an apple maggot trap, but the, the apple maggot is a close cousin to the bluebird maggot. So they uh, were able to use these tracks to trap, trap the flies, and we can tell when the flies are coming out, how many flies we have, in order to determine whether we need to spray, what we call a threshold spray, to prevent the fruit from being contaminated. So uh, that, that was a, a new development, but further on, too, we have that two-year cropping cycle. So the flies are actually fell to the soil on the crop, the crop year, which is now the non-bearing year. So when they come out, there's no fruit. Well, they just go across the rock wall, across the road where the, where the ugly worries are. And so we found, yeah, they're, they're really coming in from the woods or coming in from the fields. And if you get into the field, maybe uh, 20, 30 feet, we're below a threshold. So what that means is if we just spray the perimeter of the field, we can keep them out and we can reduce our pesticide input 80% by not doing that. So understanding the biology of this fly, very important to, in the management and very important in reducing our pesticide inputs for wild blueberries. So you could have someone with a small backpack sprayer if there's just one corner of the field, they have a trap in there, they can trap that or a small ATV sprayer. So we can really minimize uh, what we need to do. But we do need to control a maggot because uh, you can't have uh, USDA prevents uh, sales of blueberries that have uh, infested maggot infested fruits. So, so uh, here's our blueberry bloom, and that happens uh, usually around May 20 to May 30 down east. Uh, we get our, our flowers coming on on our wild blueberries, and and these really need to be insect pollinated. Uh, we had some people from Alaska call. And say, you know, you know, must be black flies must be doing something. You know, they're out there. There's plenty of them. They must be really uh, pollinating the blueberries. But the blueberry, blueberries have a very large, sticky tetrad of, of pollen, and uh, black flies are too small. So we have, we need bees. We need other other types of pollinators. So it's very important that we do have insect pollinators. And we did find, and this is a study uh, looking at increasing the number of blueberry hives per acre and adding it in. And looking at the blueberry yields, there's a lot of scatter in here because of a lot of other 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 uh, effects. But we have a very very strong relationship, and you can see right over here we don't have any beehives at all yet. We get pollination, so we have native pollinators out there. So we do know that, and we do try to encourage uh, those native pollinators uh, in in our fields themselves. So the biggest worker in the field is the honeybee, and uh, but the honeybee is a Mediterranean species. Uh, so if it's wet, if it's cold, if it's windy, they don't work, they stay home, you know, they just wait. 
But, you know, you get about 40,000 in the hive, sun comes out, 40,000 of them out there. They're pollinating really, really hard. So they do they do, do that. So uh, they are a major workforce. We had uh, probably anywhere from uh, up to 77,000 hives of, of bees imported into Maine. We're the largest uh, importer of bees, uh, honey bees, after, after the almond uh, producers in California. And we also have native bumblebees. And not only do we have native bumblebees, you can buy uh, bumblebees out of Detroit uh, for, you know, in quads. They, they come in a, a, you know, kind of a, a corrugated box with, a, with a plastic, plastic size. And you pull a plug out and we've got instant, instant beehives, mm -hmm. and bumblebee hives. And, and we do find that they will overwinter and build up, uh, build up the bumblebee population. The problem is in the early spring, uh, when bluebirds in bloom, it's just overwintering queens. So you don't have a real big, robust force of, of bumblebees, so we have to rely on bringing in these bees. Uh, but we also have hundreds of different other pollinators. We have uh, mason bees and dreaded bees that actually tie their life cycles right in to the bluebird plant itself. They are very well adapted and they're very efficient. They're like 10 times more efficient than the honeybee, but there just aren't enough of them. So we have to bring in more bees to get those yields. This is a, this might be say, well, this is ant nest, but this is actually adrenaline bees. These are soil nesting bees. They're right in the bluebird fields. They don't go very far, but again, they're very, uh, very efficient uh, pollinators, and, and we do all we can to encourage native bees because free pollination, beehives cost a, $120 a hive just to, to bring them in the field, so it's going to be a very expensive uh, process, but uh, if we can keep these bees in the field and encourage habitat for these bees, uh, then we can uh, help our, our, our baseline pollination. But the issue is that they, they, uh, they do fluctuate widely, so you can't count on them, unfortunately, or else we'd just be using native bees if we could. So this uh, particular graph is, is in time, it goes from 1985 to uh, 2017, and the uh, blue line is a yield in millions of pounds, going from 40 million up to over 100 million pounds over the years, and these are the number of hives we brought in, maybe 30,000 hives up to about uh, 60, uh, 65,000 hives, or 77,000 hives uh, this year. So you can see that we have a very strong correlation and blueberry yield and number of hives, so it's very important uh, for these, uh, these bees are very important for the productivity and uh, to allow us to grow enough blueberries on the land uh, to re keep the cost down and remain competitive with the elevated blueberry. So, bees do several things. There's more berries, uh, there's more seeds in the berries, so there's larger berries, and there's more even ripening. So, three factors all come together to greatly increase bluebird yield by using uh, by using pollination. So this is one of the, the key components that have allowed us to really increase our, our productivity over time. And as you know, uh, with the warmer temperatures and and the really erratic uh, rainfall that we've had, if we look at August, uh, you know, typically uh, we we don't get four inches of rain. We need a, an inch a week, really. Any plant, most plants need an inch a week. We know the rain. We have that really heat. Uh, then, then the blueberries are going to dry out, uh, they're going to shrink, uh, they won't fill up, we'll have very low productivity. So they, a lot of the processors have uh, uh, put uh, irrigation system, and this is a big gun irrigation. It's in ground with a, with a plastic pipe underneath here, and this will do about an acre. One acre uh, with one gun. So they'll run the gun, a uh, quarter inch, and then, uh, uh, or, or the, whatever they need beyond. What the, uh, what the rainfall is to, to make up that inch, they'll run that gun to supplement the irrigation. And this allows blueberry growers to, uh, to really hold on to all, that, all, all those berries, that they've, uh, all those inputs uh, that they've invested in. Uh, if it dries up, then they lose everything. Uh, the, the, uh, the guns enable them to uh, retain that. It's more of an insurance policy, but it's paying off uh, more, more and more lately because of uh, the erratic rainfall and the lack of rainfall that we have with a, with a warmer climate. So this is what the blueberry fields look like, and, and unlike the cultivated blueberries where they go in and they pick the early ones and they pick the, the ripe ones and, the, and they let the others uh, mature, we have a once over harvest. So we get one chance to get it right. Uh, you look at the field, they try to look at when, when they're mostly ripe, you're still gonna have a, whoops, uh, you, still, you still may have, uh, 
You still may have a few green berries in there or uh, unripe berries uh, that they, they'll have to sort out. And if you wait too long, you have mushroom berries. So you've got to kind of look at it and, and get that at right at the right moment in order to uh, get the right productivity. And, and this has been a, actually this has been a source of uh, uh, art, uh, blueberry art. They had Portland Museum of Art had a show a few years back uh, looking, uh, looking at blueberry growers and showing the rakers. A lot of kids used to do, you know, go out and a lot of people used to come from all over the country. I remember when I first started in the 1970s, I could find 50 license plates out on the blueberry garden. So everybody would come to rake blueberries. We only had about 20 million pounds, so the migrant laborers uh, really took care of that. Uh, and the, and the local kids, and they, uh, they used to whittle the berries out, and uh, this is uh, kind of what they look like. We had these machines that, that are blowers uh, that blow the sticks and the stems out uh, and put them into wooden boxes. Uh, we no longer do that. They harvest right into the boxes now. They find that uh, this keeps the berries, uh, as you handle the berries more, the quality is reduced. So having that quality uh, stay as high as you can is very, very important. Back in the 1950s, and this is a chart, uh, and if you look at Maine, we were the number one blueberry producer. We, we produced over a million quarts in production. So uh, but that's changed. Uh, where blueberry growing is, uh, not just uh, wild blueberries now, but there are lots of cultivated blueberries. And if you look at the, you know, at the North American production, you can see that's really shifted to the western. Almost 40% uh, in the West and, and also in the South. There are varieties that uh, they call southern varieties, uh, southern high bush varieties, rabbit eye varieties grown in the South. So we're becoming a much smaller, uh, a much smaller piece of that pie. Uh, and even in the Midwest, where uh, 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 Michigan used to be a, or the largest producer as well, have, have shrunk. So right now, is that the blueberry pie? Is well, it's not a blueberry pie. There's <laughs> one with a slice taken out. <laughs> so that's why you usually see them, you don't see them intact. Uh, but uh, looking at cultivated blueberries, uh, more than two-thirds of the blueberries are now cultivated and the wild, about twice as many wild in Canada that, as in Maine. So we've really seen our piece of the pie, even though, even though production has been increasing over time, our piece of the pie is shrinking because there's so many other blueberries grown so many other places uh, in, in this country, it really throughout the world. I mean, there are berries coming up now from Chile, Peru, Mexico, so the blueberries really are a worldwide crop. So we're kind of struggling to keep our 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 our, our niche uh, in in the uh, in the blueberry uh, blueberry market. Originally, they used a handheld rake, uh, and this is a tablet rake built uh, back in the 1800s, uh, just after the Civil War. Be picking them by hand, uh, they could pick them out, and they'd use those wearing machines. And they've modified that rake now, so it has two handles. And instead of having maybe uh, 40 or 42 teeth, it's got 120 teeth. So they're able to uh, uh, harvest much more efficiently with uh, a lot less stress on them. And so with some fields are still, uh, are still hand raked, especially if they're, uh, if they're um, rocky and uneven and you can't get a machine in there, they still do have uh, hand harvesting. And as I mentioned, they harvest right into the box. I used to put them in these uh, five gallon buckets and then run it through a real machine. But well, that kind of compressed the berries and you know reduced the quality. So what we want to do is have the best quality berry we can because that's what the consumer is demanding, especially Japanese market. So by just putting them in these boxes, you handle it once, it goes into the factory and gets cleaned. You don't you don't uh, you don't burst berries. Uh, you don't reduce the quality. So that's uh, that's what they do now. These are about uh, 10 kilograms, 22 22 pounds uh, in, in a wild blueberry box or a half bushel. Uh, that they still use. Uh, we do now have uh, machines with uh, mechanical harvesters with mechanical picking heads and that, that particular picking head was developed in the 1970s by Gleason Gray at the University of Maine and this was uh, picked up by a Canadian company, Bragg uh, Lumber Company and they mounted it on the side of a tractor with a conveyor coming up and it goes up and now they have these big bins that they put it in. It might, might get three, three to three, four hundred pounds in, in each of these bins. And, and you know, the, car, the cabs are air conditioned and they have these headlights up here too. So now they actually even harvest at night. It feels a level enough. And uh, they can put the GPS on, they can just uh, put the country music on and, you know, just, <laughs> just run, the, run it through. And, and it kind of it, it looks like something from another planet with all these lights out on the glimmer garments at night. 
running around. But actually, they did. They've done this a lot in the, in, in, uh, in the Pacific Northwest because they know it's cooler at night. The birds are firmer. They're going to handle better, and you have less uh, less uh, uh, less degradation of quality. So it improves the quality and improves efficiency because these machines, most of the machines, come down from Canada. So if they can uh, be here half the time and then go back up to Canada to harvest the Canadian blueberry crop, uh, this has worked, uh, worked out very well uh, for, for the industry. We do have uh, uh, harvesters for small growers. Here's a little pick behind harvester that is fashioned after the cranberry picker, the dry picker. And this made in Columbia Falls, Maine. Uh, so we do have uh, a lot of uh, organic growers or some of the smaller fresh pack growers are using, are using machines like this because uh, labor is hard to get. And then they have some smaller tractors, it's kind of rake on wheels, little tractors that, that uh, produce stuff in Quebec. So there's a various numbers of different machines now for, for the smaller grower as well as that larger, that larger grower with a picker on it, you know, probably you're looking at $150,000, $200,000 by the time you have the tractor and the picker and the heads and equipment. So it's not really for, you know, somebody with uh, 50 acres. Uh, these machines are, are along that line for, for those type of people. So when we harvest the berries, uh, they usually get put into reefers, refrigerated reefers, to get the, the, the field heat uh, out of them to, to keep them cool them down because it's very important to uh, maintain quality. The cooler the temperature, the better the quality. And then brought to processing plants. Uh, there's about a uh, half dozen processing plants in, in Maine, mostly uh, some Hancock and uh, Washington counties. And they're put on a conveyor belt, usually one, one box per second goes into, you know, gets dumped into, um, dumped in off that line. And they go through a big industrial blower. So instead of that little window machine out in the field, we have this huge, huge blower that blows all the sticks and leaves out of it. And that gives you the, prim uh, the primary cleaning, or preliminary cleaning, I should say. And then they go into wash water. Uh, so some of the berries are green, they can be, uh, can be taken out and they can be uh, cleaned out. And they go through ripple bath, and this takes out any soil, dirt, deer pellets, things like that that you really don't want in the blueberry pack. Cleans everything out all along that line. And then they go through uh, uh, instant quick freeze, IQF tunnels. These are tunnels with a conveyor belt, and they're getting blasted by minus 30 degrees right up through the berries. So these berries are kind of dancing around, and it individually freezes them. So once they particularly freeze them, they're indestructible now. They're frozen. Little, little, little pellets of blueberries. And this is how they store them, and you can store them up to three years without any degradation of quality. Locks in the flavor, nutrition, and usually our blueberries are harvested within 24 hours, or when they're processed within 24 hours of harvesting. What this does is, is it allows uh, us to keep the berries and have really fresher berries than those berries if you, if you buy those berries from uh, Chile coming up in the wintertime. They've been on a boat for a month in controlled atmosphere. You buy blueberries in the freezer, they were froze within 24 hours, which is fresher. <laughs> so most people think about just uh, buying, buying fresh blueberries, but frozen blueberries are actually a very good value, very quality. They also have sorters uh, in there to get those other, whatever doesn't get washed out. And what it is, is uh, it's a laser. And a laser goes by back and forth, and these are blurs. It's going really fast, and they have little, little air dip jets. And if there's green berry or if there is a split berry in there, it just gets kicked out. Mm -hmm. So they're able to very rapidly, uh, very rapidly clean this. We essentially have uh, you know, four to five weeks to freeze 100 million pounds of blueberries. <laughs> so you've got to do, uh, do it pretty quickly uh, when you do. Some of, the, some of the smaller processors still have, uh, have pickle lines where they, they have that last quality step of taking out any, any defects in, in the berries themselves. They're stored in tote bins, uh, and this is a plastic uh, bag liner. It's a little over 1,000 pounds, 1,100 pounds, and they're stored in the freezer. Then they can be uh, repackaged into 30-pound boxes, 15-pound uh, bags, 3-pound bags for, for uh, either the, the retail or the, the uh, home market or the uh, food service market is mostly those 30-pound uh, those cartons that you see. Also had, had some Good news for wild blueberries, and, and really one of the biggest reasons probably we're seeing this uptick in consumption and production in the United States, uh, the demand is high. Because wild blueberries, uh, there was a study at Tufts University, and they were found to have uh, the highest uh, antioxidant uh, value. So in case you want to know what they look like, these, uh, 
these are these are the bluebirds, and these are the the, the free radicals uh, <laughs> that, uh, that raise havoc with your uh, you know they're they're you get them in metabolism you know you get these uh, supercharged oxygen molecules that uh, disrupt your DNA they're saying it's cost of aging you know a lot of diseases so if you can tie these up and these bluebirds themselves have anthocyanins of these blue pigments that actually are designed to quench these free radical molecules. They're, they're designed for the plant to protect it from the sun. But when we eat it, we're able to get that protection for ourselves and, and our bodies. So this is something that's really increased the, uh, increased the uh, uh, demand for lures. And then there was a lot of studies, uh, animal studies, looking at, at, uh, at rats and, and they find they could, uh, these animal studies would actually improve their cognition and also improve their physical ability. So, how do you know a rat's smarter, or how do you improve that? So, what they do is actually, this is a tank. Whoops, uh, this is a little tank here. And rats really hate to get wet. Uh, and, they, and they have this little platform that they move around in the, in the tank. And when they throw the rat in, they have it at one spot. And they can tell when the rat swims around aimlessly, he finds out where it is. But throw it in again, he swims around, he figures out where it is. So he knows where it is. So for old rats, they got a blueberry diet, uh, got a, a diet with blueberries, could swim and be as smart as those young rats. <laughs> that, uh, you know, so there's, there's, hope, there's hope for the old rats. <laughs> so, uh, this, is, uh, this is some of the data that they've uh, used to do some studies. So the, uh, the highest antioxidant levels uh, shows improved memory and motor skills with the diet, uh, cancer fighting. The blue pigment actually improves your, your circulation and your eyesight. Uh, a lot of the Japanese love this because they just want to sit there and uh, smoke cigarettes and, and eat blueberries and you know, <laughs> still be able to read those cell phones if they, they, they have tiny, tiny print. So, uh, and they're effective as cranberries for urinary tract infections as well. So they have some very good, uh, very good properties uh, again uh, there. So we have uh, cardiovascular health, brain health, uh, ins even insulin response. You put blueberries in a muffin, and they kind of uh, keep that insulin from spiking by uh, moderating, uh, moderating that response. And cancer risk reduction as well uh, by, by uh, preventing those, uh, those free radicals from uh, harming your DNA. So mostly, uh, traditionally, we used to have blueberries, the biggest market, blueberries with muffins, and then you have packages, and yogurts, and jams, and the sugar infused, infused fruit. Uh, but now, the number one product is a smoothie. Times have changed. People don't eat as much, many as muffins. So this is really where most of our wild blueberries are going now, and, and, it's, a, and it's a very good way to, to do it. My, my wife actually even puts it in her oatmeal, wild blueberries in the oatmeal, or, or wild blueberries in the smoothie. So, essentially wild blueberries are an ingredient. 99% of wild blueberries are processed and frozen. And they're used in other products. I mean, there's some now in the retail market, you can buy it in the freezer, Wyman's has, uh, has wild blueberries. Uh, but traditionally, uh, and still, uh, wild blueberries are essentially uh, a product. We do have blueberry jams. Here's, here's one made in Maine and one, uh, one uh, Japanese one. It's the best, the blue flag's best selling blueberry jam. Best-selling jam in the country is the wild blueberry jam. So, and I'll get a Smuckers in there after. I'll get, have to get one. Good. They're saying Smuckers, uh, Smuckers now is only sources wild blueberries for there. So I'll have to promote their their, their brand of jams as well. So we're just seeing more 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 uh, products: wild blueberry teas, uh, juices. There's a pretty good blueberry wine down east. Uh, Bartlett's Maine State Winery has a very excellent dry blueberry wine. In fact, the blueberry uh, specialist from New Jersey took some bottles back to his to his growers in New Jersey, and they tasted it, and they thought it was Merlot. Yeah, <laughs> they didn't even think it was a blueberry wine, so blind uh, taste. So good. can make a good product. We also have a, a Stockton Springs as an organic, uh, organic blueberry tea, and they have a mixture of blueberries and also leaves, and they actually found the leaves had more antioxidants than blueberries themselves. Mm. So this infusion of the blueberries and the leaves gives it the flavor and it gives you these protective products. You can get this on the internet or health food stores, uh, the, uh, the uh, Highland Organic uh, Farm Blueberry Tea. So we've seen changes over time. Here's a, uh, is a bakery, and here, what is this? Pet food. 
So no, no products being developed, and you can even get you can get wild blueberries for your dog. So uh, and people will spend lots of money on their dogs. I know because I do. You know. Uh, and so the products, uh, really, we have to look at making the products that we need out there and getting people uh, to, uh, to buy these new products to increase our demand. So, well, I guess what, what's been happening uh, about 10 years ago, or, or around 2010, and this is a chart of wild blueberry production. You can see it's not quite as stable as a cultivated blueberry, you can see, but this really took off because, you know, the production back then was very, very low for the cultivated. Uh, so essentially we've seen more than a doubling in, 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 uh, in about, uh, about six or seven years, more than a doubling or quadrupling actually because we have uh, both doubling of the cultivated and a doubling of the wild blueberry. So we've seen quite a few blueberries on the market and this has had, uh, unfortunately have a depressing price on, on the price to growers that's been going down. Uh, so what we really do need to do is get more people to, uh, to, to eat more blueberries and, and you know, pretty, People are just wondering, is there you know, really too many blueberries out there, or is it just too little demand? If you look at how much strawberries we eat, we eat on the order of nine pounds of strawberries per person. For blueberries, it's only about three pounds per person. So we, you know, we got a long way to go. It's a, hard, it's a, it's a uh, much more healthier product. Uh, it's, uh, I think it tastes better than strawberries, so people like strawberries, but you know, making, uh, uh, making smoothies, Lots of other products uh, out of this is really where we need to uh, increase the demand because if you just get everybody to get a half cup a day, that's pretty pretty reasonable, half cup a day, right? We wouldn't have any problem uh, have, having oversupply. In fact, we would have to gear up and, and make a lot more blueberries. And this is what they figured uh, you need for the those uh, health effects of wild blueberries if you eat half a cup a day. Cultivated blueberries, you have to eat a whole cup, unfortunately. <laughs> You know, and, and, uh, but uh, yeah. half cup a day of blueberries. So, as Kathleen mentioned, here's the the website wildblueberries.com about the health issues, and wildblueberries.maine.edu is the extension wild blueberry site. So, hopefully, I get some time for questions now, right? Yeah. You mentioned pruning every two years. We have. So <coughs> Is it every two years, or can you wait three, four, five years? You can wait three, four, five years, but what happens, it is a perennial plant, and, and it will continue to grow, but actually the productivity then starts dropping off. Every two years, take them down. That's down. the optimal. That, that, gives, that gives you the maximum productivity. If you go, you could, uh, if you go to year three, uh, because now you're growing uh, both blueberries and buds on the same plant, and also the stems coming off, the blueberries are smaller, so you could lose up to half, 50 percent of your production going into the next year. Final question: yeah. What's the best month to take them down? Well, uh, they need to be uh, they need to be dormant. So dormant means after killing frost or before they start growing in the spring. It used to be September, but now it's like uh, almost in November before you prune them. Once you get a good killing frost and the, and the leaves turn red and they start falling off, they're dormant. Or before those leaves, the buds, those buds start breaking, breaking in April. Uh, so you know, generally, uh, you know, September uh, or, or October to April is uh, that time. Yeah. What, what percent of the main growers still harvest with hand rakes? Well, I would say probably less than 10 percent harvest with hand rakes, and usually they're more specialized for fresh market or organic. But even a lot of organic growers are now getting the, the walk behind harvesters. Uh, they have a, they can a lot of a uh, a lot of growers, if you want to really do it for fresh market, you really have to hand rake, and you have to hand rake very carefully. Uh, so the guys along the roadside this time of year are, pre you would say, are probably hand raked? Yes. Not guaranteed. But they, they can, they can. But you'll know it uh, if they've been hand raked, because they'll last a week, if they've been uh, mechanically harvested the last couple of days. You know, because it, it does, it does burst up the various quite a bit. Okay. How large a population of uh, immigrant uh, workers are needed to keep this production going? Well, it used to be when we had uh, most people were, were um, hand harvesting, we had about 8,000 coming in. Now we probably have uh, less than 1,000. Uh, really? and, and some of these are working in, in the processing plants as well. In the processing plants, uh, a lot of the, the seasonal workers are now from uh, Jamaica or... Uh, you know, 
other other uh, other countries because they're just coming in as guest uh, guest workers. It's really hard to get people, you know, come work for a month for the month of August. But some of the growers, uh, they, we still do uh, find a fair amount of uh, Mexicans coming for the hand harvest because you can make you can make quite a bit of money in a short period of time harvesting blueberries because they're. The fields are now so productive that it's a very short time to, to fill up those boxes. What kind of housing and services are they provided when they're here? Well, they do. Uh, the federal government does uh, supervise that. They do have to have uh, housing for them. And there is a, a service uh, down east. They have um, um, like a blueberry school for the children of the, of the rakers. They can't, they can't be, uh, young children can't be in the fields anymore. It's uh, prohibited, so they, they do have those type of services uh, for em in any immigrants coming in or uh, seasonal workers, there's, uh, there's uh, support for that through the state. Uh, yeah. what, what percentage of the main wild blueberry harvest is organic and is that share growing or staying about the same? Well, we have about 500 blueberry growers. We have about 50 organic blueberry growers. We have 100 million pounds and organic is only a half a million pounds. So one half of one percent, and this is because productivity is lower, the fields are smaller, uh, and, and organic. Although uh, some of the larger processors are now transitioning some of the fields into organic, we see, and also some of the processors are now certified to process organic wild blueberries. So we expect to see that half a million pounds go to you know million, million and a half, two million. We, we're seeing that trend of it, it, it increasing. Uh, over time, yeah. In management, you mentioned, uh, among other things, fungicide use. Yeah. I was wondering, is there a specificity to fungicides now, or are they mycorrhizal? What's the question? Question about fungicides? Uh, well, they don't affect the mycorrhizal uh, association because that's underneath the ground. So the fungi, the fungicides we have, will go on the foliage before the, before the when the leaves are first coming out, and it's absorbed into the stem, and it's a sterile inhibitor. So if the spore falls on the stem, it prevents that spore from germinating and infecting the plant. So there's no risk of adverse soils? Um, no, there's, there's no adverse effects of any of the fungicides we use on the mycorrhizal association of the foil. Actually, the, the most adverse effect is using uh, chemical fertilizer because that suppresses, uh, suppresses that population. But uh, by itself, we, we find that uh, in, in a lot of the uh, organic fields, don't don't need to add any fertilizer at all. You get you get you do get breakdown, and, and you know you think well you're taking from the land, but you know if you look at the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus from that blueberries taken from the soil, it's only a few pounds a year. So you're really not taking a lot away. It's not like a, a plant like tobacco that rots all the nutrients from the soil. Yeah, yeah. Would you talk about hybrid uh, hybrid blueberries pruning and the disease of uh, the broom? Oh, you mean witch's broom? Yes. Yeah, uh, the witch's broom is again, it's a fungal disease and the alternate host is balsam fir. So, you know, you really can't cut down all the balsam fir you have. But essentially, what you do when you see that witch's broom growth is just prune down below there and take it out, but there's going to be, it's going to be reinfected. It's nothing, uh, it's a stomach, you can't spray for it or anything. There's no, there's no, uh, there's no way to prevent that from happening as, as we do with the mummy berry disease. So, uh, so essentially it's just clean, clean management, cultural management, just clip it off, take it off site. So, so the spores aren't there to be yeah. What about pruning? Pruning the plants. Yes. Well, you should have Dave Handley here. He's, uh, <laughs> he does it cultivated. Essentially, again, what you want to do is when those plants grow up over time, uh, they get a lot of vegetative growth and they shade out the plant itself and they get really, really little spindly stems. So you go in there and, and actually you take out the biggest and oldest stems and take about one third of the stems, you prune it right down to the base of the plant and you pull those stems out. And what this does is open the canopy and it will stimulate new shoots coming up. And those new shoots will be more productive and also by taking that canopy out where you go a lot more light and that light will allow you to have more buds and more fruit. So, and there's lots of there's lots of videos on YouTube. Uh, you know, there's probably hundreds of videos on how to prune a high bush blueberry. And what is the best time to do that? Again, when they're dormant. 
Probably best to, is the best time probably for them is in the spring because so if you have any winter injury, you can see it uh, in the spring. So I would say in spring before they start growing again. Yeah. 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 Just uh, along with your question, uh, does does growth uh, accelerate if you pick the entire high bush? I, we have some on the lake, so I can't get to all of them. But is it better to pick every? On the well, you know, if they're smaller or undeveloped, they don't they don't all ripen evenly. So if you yeah. take the right, it's like cucumber, if you take the right ones off, they get you stimulate the growth to yeah. the rest of the nutrients go to the remaining berries. So you know, it, yeah, you take all the right ones off because yeah. they're gonna fall yeah. off anyway. So right. or the birds are gonna get them. So right. uh, and not all of them ripe ripen at the same time. So right. yeah, and cultivated typically they will go through and have maybe four or five pickings, uh, hand picking. Before they and before they kind of shake off the the, the the end of the crop there. So yeah, yeah. If you want to have a little patch of wild blueberries, uh, should you get blueberry sod or is there something better? The uh, uh, question about having a patch of blueberry sod is really the best resource because it's ready made. I mean, you can get plants that are tissue culture of seedlings, but they have very small plants, and their survival might not be all that great, and it takes a much higher density, but so yeah, there are sources, uh, a, a lot of um, nurseries now will have, uh, and there's several, several different, different places. If you just go on the web and Google it, you'll find that it's a half dozen different nurseries. And what you want to do is you want to plant those in a very uh, acidic, well-drained soil with full sunlight. Because if you don't, if you don't have full sunlight, if you put it in the shade, you just don't get any fruit <laughs> in the shade. Because the berries need sun on that. Yeah. How do you manage the entire waste stream of both the plant material as well as the water? Well, the water itself is, is not an issue. Water is being uh, taken uh, sourced from either reservoirs for spring runoff or wells that are in an aquifer. So essentially pumping it out of the aquifer and you're spraying it on the fields and it goes back down into the aquifer. Even the waste stream, uh, all that wastewater that they have from the plant is actually just pumped back out on the blueberry fields goes back into the aquifer. The aquifer is great. You get this uh, 200 feet of sand, it cleans that water by the time it gets back down there. It's clean. And, and we do see kind of a cone of depression that they, they have around the pumps. Uh, initially, but by, by the fall, after we have the fall recharge, but it's the, the aquifer comes back out. So we're not mining the water. We're just sourcing the water temporarily, and it's recycled back and through. Now, a lot of that waste that comes off, a lot of sticks and stems and, and the green berries, are then uh, taken out to the field and composted. They'll compost it, uh, turn it over, and they'll spread it back onto the blueberry field. So it's really a complete closed system, both for water and waste uh, for the materials. Yep. I wanted to know, um, the main blueberries are so different than what you see anywhere else. And I wanted to know, is it just this area in Maine that they're small in the state of Maine, or is it outside also in other states? Because you saw you saw your picture of the pies, there's so many other areas of the world that have blueberries. Are we known just for the small ones here? Well, Maine, uh, blueberries have grown Maine, maritime provinces in Quebec, commercially. You, find, you can find them in New Hampshire and Massachusetts, especially up in the hills. Heath, Heath Massachusetts, which is uh, by north of Northfield there. And, and uh, there, there are cer certainly areas that they, they, uh, they will higher elevations in western Maine. They, they grow wild blueberries. And actually, they grow naturally all the way to the Appalachian Mountains down to Georgia. You can find them. But commercial production, I mean, you used, used to have them in Connecticut. Now you have houses. You know, it's nice all of and all nice land was taken up. So you, you can have them, you know, growing far down, really is into North uh, North Carolina or so. But um, really, the, the species that we have here commercially are mainly in Canada. For that, yeah. Um, I was um, hiking in the Yorkshire Dales earlier this year, uh -huh. and I came across something which I thought was a main wild blueberry. Explain it's a bilberry. Well, there are a couple types of bilberries, uh, and I think probably uh, there's a bilberry called Vaccinium uliginosum. It's a bog bilberry, which is more like that. And then you have a Vaccinium myrtillus, which is in France, Scandinavia, Poland, a little bit further further north. I guess you're pretty pretty far north in England too. Yeah. But it's probably one of those two species. 
And those are, those are uh, essentially that little blackberry that you, where I saw. That's the ecological equivalent to, to our blueberry. It's a different species. Uh, they're, they're, they're all related. Uh, yep. Yeah, you know, a little bit more tart, a little bit more concentrated How flavor tart. Ours, uh, <laughs> well, that's good to know. This will be the last question to go for. I wanted to know, I know a local blueberry um, farmer, and he's telling me some of the farmers are leaving the blueberries <coughs> and not having to harvest it because of the price of 26 cents a pound. And I didn't know if that was really going on, or is it just more local? That no, no, the, the prices, uh, again, I showed that, you know, that uh, quadrupling of the crop over the time. And it's basically a supply and demand. If you, you know, if you, your supply exceeds your demand and your freezers are full, uh, then, in the, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll last in the freezer two or three years. So we've, uh, we've really done well at producing wild blueberries, but we've kind of, uh, you know, uh, at this point in time, we've exceeded the demand, but we've seen that happen multiple times. This isn't the first time that's happened. Price goes up and it's gone down. Price has ranged from um, dollar over a dollar a pound down to 20 cents, you know, over the years. So it does fluctuate with productivity and, and uh, production in Canada and, and uh, cultivated is really what's happening. And a lot of small growers may be going out of business, yes. How much do you spend on marketing? Do you have a graph of marketing expenditures? About a million dollars uh, marketing. Has that changed? Uh, well, the marketing uh, budget is uh, comes with the crop. A, they have uh, a blueberry tax, a penny and a half a pound. It's three quarters cents for growing and three quarters cents for processing. And that goes to the Wild Blueberry Commission, and the Wild Blueberry Commission supports the, the Wild Blueberry Association of North America. And they have marketing efforts. We have uh, a, a person at the Blueberry Commission that goes to China, North Korea, Germany, um, UK, you know, promoting wild blueberries. So there, there's extensive efforts to promote blueberries uh, throughout the world, and, and we are opening some more markets. But right now, it uh, doesn't look like uh, China is a very good one. But, uh, so, unfortunately, yeah. Is there a tariff now? Oh, there was a 30% tariff to China, went to 40. Yeah. At this time, I would like to thank Professor David Yarborough and I.